Uh, good evening. Welcome back to the Pearl Gray Price channel. We are coming to you today on Sunday, April 26th, the second Sunday of Easter, also called Good Shepherd Sunday in the traditional Roman calendar. Uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, we watched on television through YouTube the traditional Latin Mass. Uh, we're very lucky that in this time when we're deprived of the sacraments, we're at least able to assist and participate at the Mass via uh, the Internet. And I uh, encourage anybody who's watching this to avail themselves of the chance to do that, particularly the chance to observe the traditional Latin Mass, which is quite ubiquitous on the Internet. And if you have not had a chance to participate in the traditional Mass and in its great beauty, in its great antiquity. I hope that uh, during this time when you may be quarantined and locked down and having nothing else to do, you might avail yourself of the opportunity to, uh, to see something so spectacular, you know, even as it's presented uh, on YouTube. I also want to announce this evening that um, my book, my play, The Pearl of Great Price, is now available as an ebook on Amazon. You can download it for use on Kindle. It costs $9.99. Um, so the book is available in hardcover, in paperback, or by ebook. And if you haven't purchased the book or had a chance to take a look at it, I hope you'll take the opportunity to do so now, uh, particularly with the ease of, of course, having it downloaded straight to your Kindle. Uh, this evening I wanted to talk for a few minutes about King Louis XVI and his role uh, in the early period of the French Revolution. As we've discussed in prior uh, videos, um, my book, The Pearl of Great Price, is about the events that happened in Rome uh, in 1798 and 1799, so in the latter part of the French Revolution when revolutionary France invaded Rome and captured Pope Pius VI and took him prisoner. That is what uh, my book is concerned with. Uh, however, the revolution itself, the French Revolution itself, uh, dates back a decade earlier. Uh, the revolution, as many of you know, began in 1789. Uh, so by the time you get to the events in my book, many, many things have already happened in the revolutionary period um, by the time that the French get around to invading Rome and attempting to eradicate the papacy. That's the story told here. Uh, what I want to visit tonight uh, is a few minutes on King Louis XVI and uh, what happened to him uh, in the early period of the revolution. Uh, because, again, the revolution started really in May of 1789 when uh, the French Estates General met uh, and uh, that, that was the event that kicked off the, the commencement of the revolution, the, the, the meeting of the Estates General, the first time it had met since the 1600s. And uh, Louis uh, only lives till uh, early January 1793, at which time he's executed. So um, he, he spends a few years from 1789 to 1793 at the center of the storm. Um, and he's a very interesting figure, uh, as is his wife Marie Antoinette, neither of whom are particularly lionized by history, uh, but both of whom I think um, deserve a, a, a much better, more fair treatment, uh, particularly Louis, uh, because I think he was a, a man of, of great courage in the end and true uh, Christian piety. Um, and it was his piety that stayed his hand against his countrymen, um, even those who hated him and reviled him and eventually saw him executed as the symbol of all that they wished to tear down. Uh, Louis could have reacted in a much more bloody um, and Machiavellian way than he did. And ironically, um, just as uh, really is the fate of any true and good Christian. It was his self-sacrifice and his unwillingness um, to raise a hand against his enemies that resulted in his, his death. Now, from a worldly standpoint, a political standpoint, a Machiavellian standpoint, you could say he was a bad prince, a bad king, because he let um, the revolution get out of control 
and he uh, didn't know how to use his power effectively to preserve himself and to preserve the monarchy. And that's a fair uh, critique. Um, but from a Christian perspective, which of course is the only one that really matters in the end, um, it's hard to see Louis as anything but a, a, a rather a saintly man and, 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 a, and, a, and a hero in many, in many regards. So as I mentioned, the calling of the Estates General, the meeting of the ancient orders of France, the three estates, the clergy, the nobility, and the common people, um, uh, occurred for the first time in well over a century in May of 1789. And right from the beginning, there was a great struggle uh, where the third estate, the, the, the common people, sought to assert its rights. Uh, they were particularly upset um, and uh, were dissatisfied with the arrangement because the estates voted by order, not by individuals. So the first estate had a vote, the second estate had a vote, and the third estate had a vote. Because the most numerous estate, of course, was the common people, but it only had one vote because the, the, the uh, estates voted by, by corporate body. So this becomes a great uh, consternation and debate that stymies the, um, the Estates General from making any progress after it's initially called to try to address some of the inequities and ills that were affecting French society uh, that, that caused the king to convene the Estates General uh, to begin with. Ironically, it is the clergy, the lower clergy, the church essentially, the parish priests, the curés of France, who sympathize with the third estate. And the curés, uh, the common priests, they end up breaking the stalemate. They, they go over to the third estate eventually um, in late June of 1789. And uh, with the, the support of a handful of reform-minded bishops, the curés joined into session with the third estate, thereby destroying the traditional system of voting by separate order. Um, and they took their place in what became then known as the National Assembly on June 24th, 1789. I think that's one of the great ironies of history and something to keep in mind as you try to understand these events and understand the uh, history particularly of the church. Uh, it is the church through its clergy in France that enables the revolution to begin. Uh, because it was the, the, the curés, as I said, who break the stalemate, who defect, if you will, against the orders of the bishops. The bishops and the nobles do not want to change the system. They want to vote by order. They want to maintain the estates general as it always had been. But the lower clergy breaks with them, and eventually it forces the situation. And so, although uh, the king, King Louis the Sixteenth, was initially... Um, resistant to these types of changes and was initially in league with the bishops of the first estate and the nobles of the second estate, once the lower clergy joined together um, with the third estate, the king, the king relents. And on June 27, 1789, uh, King Louis commanded the orders to sit together as one body, eliminating those traditional distinctions of the three orders, and that is how the National Assembly, the famous or infamous National Assembly, uh, came into being. So it comes into being really by two uh, uh, precipitating forces. One is the clergy, and the other is finally the sanction of the king. So Louis does not disband the, the Estates General. He does not call in the army. He does not, in the end, attempt at all costs to preserve the old order. In fact, he lets it die. And once the National Assembly is founded, that's really the end of the Ancien Regime. Uh, yet by the fall of 1789, so remember, that's June of 1789, the clergy through the church and the king have supported the reform that the reformers sought. They created the National Assembly. Fine, great. However, by the fall the reformers are ready to go even farther. So only a few months go by before the revolution already starts to spin out of control. 
Uh, in October 1789, um, there was a, a great mob of peasants who marched from Paris to the royal palace at Versailles, where, where Louis was with his family. And uh, the crowds bro basically broke into Versailles. Um, <clears throat> Louis refuses to, again, cause any bloodshed. He does not want to harm his countrymen, um, even, even at, at the peril of his own life and that of his family. He meets with um, these invaders, and he assures them of his general support for the reforms of the revolution. Basically, he tells them that he agrees that, um, th that France should be transformed into a constitutional monarchy. He tells them that he will um, sign the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which is sort of the great manifesto of the revolution, right? Liberty, equality, fraternity. And he agrees to move the royal family from um, the great hunting lodge of the Sun King, Louis XIV, um, back from Versailles to Paris. Um, so in the early period, the king is trying to appease the revolution's demands. And along with a number of the leading bishops in France, they hold out hope that the revolution and religion and um, the flourishing of traditional French Catholic life uh, will be married together. And they are looking to moderate the revolution, but also to, to allow some of these reforms uh, to be carried out, to, 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 to allow for an assembly, allow for a greater voice of the people, they'll acquiesce to the liberty, equality, and fraternity ideas, and essentially they want to have a constitutional monarchy um, and preserve a, a proportionate role for the church. On the first Bastille Day, right, a year after the fall of the Bastille in July of 1789, um, the king participates in the anniversary of that event. Of course, in history, we don't see that as a pro-monarchy event. If anything, it's, it's of course, marked as the, the, uh, the end of the Ancien Regime by most people, uh, the beginning of democratic France. Um, but there is the king. He, he is participating on July 14, 1790, in celebrating Bastille Day. Again, trying to show that he is on board with these reforms. Two days before the first Bastille Day, however, a very important and very fateful event takes place. And on that day, July 12, 1790, the National Assembly adopts the infamous civil constitution of the clergy. The civil constitution was a legislative scheme designed to transform the church into an arm of the state. Under the civil constitution, the state would govern and erect the various dioceses around the country and set rules for the governance of the diocese and instituted a system uh, to elect bishops and to appoint curates. So the state was going to intervene essentially to run the church as an arm of the state under this civil constitution of the, of the clergy. Uh, interestingly, uh, the proponents of the civil constitution uh, claim that they are doing this for the good of the church, that they are only restoring the ancient discipline of the church. Uh, they're not uh, anti-Christian. They are pro-Christian. They want to bring the church back to its ancient roots. That, of course, is a theme that redounds throughout church history, a very important theme of the Vatican II reformers. Uh, it's always the return to the ancient practices that is used uh, to justify uh, these sorts of um, attacks on the church, if you will. And I think it's quite interesting that, that the proponents of the civil constitution used those uh, types of arguments to justify uh, uh, a, a, essentially a, a civil takeover of ecclesial affairs. Now the moderate bishops, who again are trying to work with the king to keep the lid on this, this uh, uh, boiling pot, um, are looking incessantly for ways to, um, uh, to make a compromise that will protect the liberty of the church and the integrity of the church 
as a separate, independent society, uh, but that also will accede to some of these revolutionary style demands. Uh, Louis, now remember, now Louis is now a constitutional monarch. And as the executive of the country, he has to sign the civil constitution of the church to make clergy to make it law. It's been passed by the National Assembly. It's been sent to the king. He does not want to sign the legislation. He does not want to attack the church. He is a very pious man. He is very uncomfortable with the idea of undermining the liberty of the church and the authority of the papacy over the clergy. So he plays for time. He plays for time, constantly looking for a compromise and hoping that uh, the bishops will be able to help him and that Rome will be able to help him. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the revolutionaries were uncompromising. And on July 22, 1790, Louis informed the assembly that he would sanction the civil constitution. Uh, he delays, he delays, he delays. Uh, <clears throat> The Pope, Pope Pius VI, again, same Pope who's uh, discussed and uh, profiled in my book. He is in Rome. He is watching with quiet horror what's unfolding in France. He takes a very hard line, although privately. He does not come out publicly and condemn the revolution. But privately, he is telling the Roman clergy um, and his uh, uh, arms in France resist this at all costs this is evil this this is this this revolutionary movement is anti-christian and you cannot accede to it um, <clears throat> and so he 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 wants the king to unequivocally reject the civil constitution the king wants to but he can't um, he feels politically constrained again in july he promises to sign it he dithers, he delays, he hopes that they can compromise. Eventually they cannot compromise. He's constantly under pressure. And on August 24th, 1790, he receives a, uh, on that, that evening, he receives uh, uh, felicitations from the members of the National Assembly uh, congratulating him on his name day, August 25th, Feast of St. Louis. And that's taken as a, um, a, a warning to him like, we're watching you, and you better get this thing signed. And he reads that as a, um, a, a final demand. And he does indeed thereafter, right thereafter, sign the civil constitution. And that is a great and tragic moment because uh, it sets the revolution on its inevitable, uh, or what on a course, I shouldn't say it was inevitable, but once that is signed, the, the revolution um, is set irrevocably on, on its tragic path. The hope for a moderate revolution um, uh, it goes away. There will be no compromise, and uh, that's the first great victory, the uh, control of the church. And the control of the church, and either the diminishment or eradication of Christianity, becomes the obsession of the revolution. And so, this, even the civil constitution is not enough. Um, by October, uh, the bishops are pushing back um, even more. Now they are becoming very alarmed. Even the, the moderate bishops are pushing back against the civil constitution. On October 30th, 1790, uh, leading bishops published what was called the Exposition of Principles. The Exposition of Principles in which they reaffirmed their general support for the revolution, but rejected the civil constitution, insisting that the state could not intrude upon the prerogatives of the church. Uh, its author was the Archbishop of A, AIX, and he was the very man who had presided over the session of the Estates General, in which the clergy voted to merge with the Third Estate. In, in other words, he was a pro-revolution or pro-reform bishop who enabled was one of the key men who enabled the transformation of the Estates General into the National Assembly. And here he is, a year later, being put in a position where he's begging the revolutionaries, he's begging the new government to show moderation um, towards the Church. 
the exposition of principles is ignored, and on November 27, 1790, the Assembly enacts a new law requiring all clergy to swear an oath to uphold the civil constitution of the clergy and to recognize the supremacy of, revol of the revolutionary French state. So in other words, they pass the civil constitution, there's resistance, it's not being accepted or implemented, so they go a step further. Instead of moderating, they go a step further, and now they were going to require all clergy, all priests and bishops, to swear an oath whereby they will agree uh, in a solemn oath to uphold the civil constitution, obey the civil constitution, and recognize the supremacy of the French state over the papacy, essentially, over any other power. The king is appalled by this. <clears throat> Again, he seeks compromise. Uh, he does not wish for violence, and he doesn't want to divide the church. He's very concerned that the uh, French church will be split off from the universal church. And there are a lot of accusations that by the king's resistance, he is causing a schism. Uh, the pro-constitution, the pro-oath faction uses the, the terrible pejorative term schism against the king, saying that the king is causing the schism by refusing to allow um, or to support the notion that the French clergy would go along with the, with the, uh, with the oath and with the civil constitution. The king again looks for compromise. He writes to Pope uh, Pius VI. He begs Pius to allow the French clergy to take the oath if the oath can contain some sort of qualifications to soften its absolutism, to give some out to the clergy. Yes, they will support the Constitution, but they also remain a subject to the Roman pontiff, something along those lines. Um, the Pope refuses to consider any such thing. He unequivocally rejects the idea that any clergyman may sign the oath. He prohibits the clergy from signing the oath. And as usual, the revolutionaries are equally um, defiant. They will brook no compromise. The oath must be an absolute uh, promise of allegiance to the civil constitution and the French Revolution. Louis is trapped. He, again, is trying to balance um, uh, his need to maintain civil order with his religious convictions. He elects to sanction the oath, finally. He does so by signing the legislation that institutes the oath on St. Stephen's Day, uh, December 26, 1790. And for him, that becomes the limit. The sanctioning of the oath would be his last official act in support of the revolution. When the assembly reopens the next year, January 4th, 1791, all of the clerical members of the assembly are required to swear the oath at the roll call. So this is the first session of the assembly. It's opening a new year after the passage of the, uh, uh, the legislation requiring the oath. And at the roll call, all of the members of the assembly who are clerics are required to stand up and swear the oath. Amazingly, only two of the bishops out of 44 who were members of the assembly swore the oath that day, and two-thirds of the, of the cures, the simple priests, also refused to swear the oath. So now there's a great divide. There the divide becomes between the juring clergy, as they're called, the swearing clergy, and the non-juring clergy, who will not swear the oath. And there is a schism within the French church, the juring church and the non-juring church, those who accept and acquiesce and those who refuse. For his part, uh, Louis never accepted the so-called constitutional church. He refused to accept communion from a, um, a juring priest. In the, in the summer of 1791, Louis wrote letters that he intended to be read after he had escaped from France. He was trying to escape and he was leaving uh, uh, messages behind that he wanted to be read when he was safely out of the country. And in those letters, he disavowed the civil constitution 
and he expressed his regret for ever having signed it. Uh, even though he um, uh, had a cabinet uh, full of revolutionaries, he refused to dismiss his non-juring confessor. So his, his confessor was, uh, refused, was a priest who refused to swear the oath. <clears throat> now, uh, by the time we get to November 1791, uh, the, the Legislative Assembly, now the National Assembly is now called the Legislative Assembly, uh, it is going further and further in trying to force priests to swear the oath. In November 1791, uh, the Legislative Assembly passed a new measure requiring all priests to swear the oath, oath excuse me, or forfeit their pensions and subject themselves to special government supervision. In May 1792, the Assembly went further, enacting a law that mandated the deportation of any priest who would not swear the oath and who was then uh, simultaneously denounced, as they say, by 20 citizens. Uh, to these measures, Louis would not give his sanction. So these two enforcement measures in late 1791 and mid-1792, Louis simply refuses. Uh, he had given all the ground that he was willing to give. He was uh, broken by the uh, uh, acts of the revolution, and he finally uh, could take no more. His conscience would allow him to take no more. And he draws the line there. He will not sign into law the two uh, acts I just mentioned that were intended to threaten and cajole priests into swearing the oath. On June 19, 1792, the king issued a formal message to the assembly wherein he announced his refusal to sanction the deportation decree. His defiance precipitated the end of his life. The next day, which was the anniversary of the tennis court oath, the anniversary of the day that the clergy broke with the, the, uh, the uh, first and the second estate and, and established the National Assembly. So on the anniversary of that very day, a mob of 20,000 Parisians demanded the right to march through the legislative chamber to protest the king's veto. And they stormed through the legislature, they pour out into the Tuileries Palace in France, um, but the Louvre, where the royal family is living, okay? And they, they break in into, into the, the king's private rooms. Marie Antoinette, the queen, she flees and hides in a secret room with the couple's two children. Louis confronts the, the mob. Louis confronts the mob again for the second time. He confronts a violent mob, and he spends 24 hours, uh, aided by his sister, um, treating with the mob and trying to convince them that he um, uh, has their interests at heart, but that he cannot, in conscience, uh, attack priests the way in which um, that legislation would have required that he do. Uh, again, he takes no action in anger, and he refuses to order his loyal soldiers to fire on any of the Parisians who are uh, marauding through the palace. Um, but, and the mob, the mob relents, uh, in large part because of Louis's calm demeanor. Um, but his uh, victory there, again, is short-lived, and by the summer of 1792, uh, things are going further out of control, uh, there are radicals in charge of uh, the, uh, the Legislative Assembly. And on August 10th, another mob invades the Tuileries. And this time, they basically force the royal family into prison. They, they cart them off, and the family uh, becomes imprisoned in what was called the Temple. Um, it's a, a medieval fortress in Paris that had been built by the Knights Templar. So now the royal family is held as a prisoner, uh, prisoners after August 10th. Of 1792. Uh, Louis spent his final months imprisoned with his beloved family and they did truly love each other uh, even though the marriage with Marie Antoinette the great beautiful Austrian princess was an arranged marriage they came to have a true affection um, and uh, respect for each other Marie Antoinette although of course pilloried by history was also a very very brave and pious woman uh, who loved Louis and loved their children and he was faithful to her, unlike his predecessors, who had many mistresses. 
certainly Louis the Fifteenth had mistresses. Louis the Fourteenth also did, but uh, Louis the Sixteenth was a very pious and faithful man, uh, and they were a real family. And it's very, very tragic what happened to uh, not just the king and queen, but also to the to their children, particularly their son, who was just tormented um, and 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 died a sick and twisted person. Um, the um, <clears throat> the king spends his time with the family. He spends his time reading. He has a particular affection for the great, famous work of Thomas a Kempis, The Imitation of Christ. Um, but by September, um, the radicals are truly even more firmly in charge now. We have the convention phase of the revolution. And on September 20th, 1792, uh, the convention votes to depart depose the king to end the monarchy and it was the convention that would be louis judge and jury on december 11 1792 the convention indicted the king on 43 charges uh, the king denied them calmly taking particular exception to the charge that he had shed the blood of his countrymen and in his response he notes that in truth he had done everything possible to avoid violence against the people Louis' trial was set down for December 26th, again the Feast of St. Stephen, two years to the day after he had approved the legislation that imposed the oath. So two years after he had given the revolution his last measure of support, he's put on trial for his life. On Christmas Day, 1792, Louis wrote out an extraordinary last will. The king entrusted his soul to the mercy of God, forgave his tormentors, and confessed his total obedience to the church. His one stated regret was that he had sanctioned acts against her unity and her discipline. The next day, at the brief trial, Louis and his lawyers argued his innocence to no avail. On January 15, 1793, the convention overwhelmingly voted to convict the king of treason. Two days later, the convention sentenced him to death. The resolution to condemn the king to death carried by a single vote. On the Feast of St. Agnes, 21 January 1793, the King of France was accompanied to the scaffold by a non-juring priest who had offered Mass for him at his final sunrise. So Louis heard Mass on St. Agnes Day, a day, feast day of the martyrs, red vestments. He heard Mass at dawn <clears throat> on, on the 21st of January. And that same non-juring priest accompanied him to the guillotine. Before the guillotine and over the din of the drums that were played to uh, dramatize his death, Louis called out his last words. I die innocent, quote, I die innocent of all the crimes imputed to me. I pardon those who have sought my death, and I pray to God that the blood you were about to shed never returns to plague France, end quote. And that is how King Louis XVI went to his death. So, I offer those uh, thoughts to you about uh, this man, Louis XVI, his great trials and tribulations, his Christian spirit. Uh, he is a man who was a victim of a rampaging and out-of-control ideology uh, that caused so much harm to so many and did so much harm to the church. This is where the whole calamities that befall the church in the modern era really begin uh, and and really accelerate. This is where Pope Pius VI learns to be horrified by the French Revolution and to fear the French. And about uh, five years later, he, his worst fears would come true when the French come uh, to Rome itself and take him prisoner and treat him in a manner similar uh, to that in which they had treated their own king beforehand. And again, that story is told in The Pearl of Great Price. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, little lecture uh, here on the 57th day of our quarantine in New York. We pray to God for all those who are suffering, who are sick. We pray for the repose of the souls of all who have died. And we pray for God's mercy on all of us that he will see us through these terrible times. And remember, all of the hairs on your head have been counted. So have faith. God bless you.